What's your favorite memory of your vacation? Spending time on the beach? Finding that lovely cedar pendant in the sand? Or maybe contracting inside-outside rot? To each their own, I guess. I surely cannot tell you which of these memories is more special, but for the latter to occur, you would need to have encountered the Lishmania family. Lishmania are closely related single-celled parasite species which are responsible for the very serious disease Lishmaniosis or Lishmaniasis, depending on where they learned medical Latin. They can infect all sorts of mammalian species, including humans, and can attack various organs in the body. The Lishmaniosis of dogs has the greatest veterinary significance. So how can one get infected? Although the parasite replicates in great quantities in the mammalian host, it's utterly untalented at jumping to another one directly. Direct host-to-host -host infection, therefore, is mostly confined to Hollywood B-movie-like situations, such as receiving a blood transfusion from an infected ex-marine because that's your only chance of surviving in the aftermath of an alien onslaught. Otherwise, Lishmania needs the help of blood-sucking arthropods, namely the females of sand flies, to spread. I said females. That's better. So, why females? Because they're the ones that suck blood. And when they do that on an infected host, they ingest the parasite and at the next bite inoculate it into a new one. Sandflies have an exclusive contract to spread Lishmania, so infection only occurs where sandflies live. And let me tell you, sandflies hate the freaking cold. This is why Lishmania, along with the sandflies, is mostly prevalent in tropical and subtropical regions of the world. At least so far. Due to climate change, the habitats of sandflies are ever-growing, so it's just a question of time for Lishmania to bust in through the front gate into areas currently untouched by the parasite. Inside the sandfly, Lishmania is present in what is called a promastigote form, wielding a flagellum and blocking the fly's sucking apparatus together with a bunch of its friends. During the bite, the insect sort of sneezes out the parasites right into the brand new host. Inside the host, immune cells of the body attack and devour the promestigotes, and while they are celebrating a job well done, Lishmania, instead of dying, shed their flagella and morph into fat amastigotes right inside the immune cells. What's this? There are two of them now? Yup, they divide. It's just one of Mother Nature's ironic tricks that the parasites replicate inside the very cells that were supposed to kill them. However, cells tend to get crowded after some time, so amastigotes escape by ripping them open, after which other immune cells pick them up. Bunch of imbeciles. This is how Lishmania spreads in the tissues, or even in the whole body if it enters the bloodstream. Sandflies will of course easily siphon up some of the amastigotes from the blood and will transform them into infective promastigotes in 6 to 9 days and we're back to where we started. But let's see what symptoms and damage Lishmania is responsible for in the host. Well, this greatly depends on which of the Lishmania species one gets infected with and on the type and strength of the immune response mounted. First of all, the infection is oftentimes asymptomatic. Yup, you there reading Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations for the 17th time aren't even aware that you got infected three years ago under a palm tree. What? Three years? Yes, Lishmania can be active for years in the body without any signs, but who or whatever host is asymptomatic is not guaranteed to remain that way. The mildest symptomatic form of the disease is cutaneous leishmaniosis, which produces deep oozing and crusty sores on the skin, lasting for months, during which time they can grow or multiply along the paths of the lymphatic vessels. When they eventually heal, they leave unsightful, jagged scars behind that you could grate cheese on. Somewhat worse is the mucocutaneous form of the disease, which is characterized by the horrible destruction of nasal and oral tissues. Um, I thought presenting it on a clown would make it less scary. Well, anyway, this form could possibly lead to death, but at the very least its healing is followed by a significant decrease in quality of life. 
The most severe form of the infection is visceral leishmaniosis, which attacks and kind of liquefies the spleen, the liver and the bone marrow and is quite often fatal. The different categories don't always present themselves in clear separation, but using them is still practical as they can generally be linked to specific Leishmania species with entertaining and easy to remember Latin names. In dogs, we usually see a combination of the cutaneous and visceral forms, which is caused by the same Leishmania agent as the human visceral disease. Cutaneous form on its own is quite rare in dogs, but asymptomatic carrying is very frequent, which makes dogs the main reservoirs of human visceral leishmaniosis in affected geographical areas. Why the infection remains asymptomatic in some cases but not in others is still an active field of study. It is possible that some symptoms are the result of an overreaction of the immune system, which causes massive, damaging inflammation and doesn't even manage to eliminate the parasite. It's like that incompetent but very industrious colleague who stays in the office till 8 pm every day and does nothing but stuff balls of paper under his eyelids. And the boss won't fire him because he's her step nephew. This immune response gone wrong often leads to the formation of a substance called immune complex biological garbage practically, which tends to get deposited in the kidneys. This is the reason why kidney failure is a common complication of leishmaniosis. Diagnosing the disease is not that straightforward. The symptoms detailed above are suggestive enough but can also indicate other illnesses, so our goal is to detect the presence of the parasite directly or indirectly. Amastigotes are often visible through the microscope in tissue samples taken from the sores or from the bone marrow, however it is easy to glance over them if they are only present in small numbers. It's much more reliable to look for the genetic material of Leishmania with a special method called PCR, as this also works with only a couple of parasites loitering about. Detecting antibodies produced by the host's immune system against the germ is also an option, but unfortunately plenty of times no antibodies can be detected despite an active infection. A negative result, therefore, is not to be trusted. After all the above, I'm sure most people have a strong itch to nuke the bastards! Bad news, everyone. There are no substances that reliably destroy Leishmania in the body. The disease can be treated to ease the symptoms, even to kill some of the parasites, but complete eradication is up to the host's immune system. Sometimes it succeeds, other times it doesn't. So we're better off preventing the infection wherever, whenever and however we can. First, are there any vaccines against the disease? None for people, sorry. There are a few products for dogs, but their efficiency is really far from impressing anybody's hypochondriac grandma just yet. Second, protect yourself against sand flies. It helps if you move to the North Pole or to the Moon, but in case you find yourselves where sand flies live and thrive, use mosquito repellents, long sleeves or insect screens. Pretty closely woven ones though, because the little bastards fit right through the conventional hole size. It's best if you can't even see through it, there's nothing worth looking at on the other side anyway. You can expect sandflies to attack after sundown or at night. Oh, and you don't need to be near a body of water to encounter them, as the larvae of sandflies, as opposed to those of mosquitoes, don't develop in water but in decomposing organic matter. And third, protect your dog too against sandflies. This is not only Doodly Boo's best interest, considering any asymptomatically infected dog will act as an invisible source of human leishmaniosis for years to come. The best way to protect dogs is with veterinary sandfly slash mosquito repellents, which come in the forms of medicated collars or spot-ons, the former giving several months of continuous protection and the latter usually lasting for weeks. Both provide a protective layer on the skin, the touching of which sand flies consider to be way below their moral character. You can acquire these products from your local veterinarian. Summing it up. Leishmaniosis is a parasitic disease so horrible that you wouldn't want to have it even for free. More than twice. It attacks all sorts of mammals, including humans. Their sandfly vectors live in warm regions of the world, but their territories are continuously expanding towards the north and the south. 
In locations where Leishmania are prevalent, it's especially important to protect not just yourself but your dog as well against sand flies, because dogs are the main reservoirs of human visceral leishmaniosis. And generally speaking, nobody wants to die. In accordance with regulation number mm, Dix, no cartoon characters were harmed during the making of this video. Yeah. The technical information in this video was fact-checked by smart people Nandor Balog and Balash Tancos. I thank them very much, as much as I thank Bayer for its support. If you've made it this far, why not like, comment or subscribe, or check out my other videos. I know it would make at least one of us happy.